Okay, thank you everyone for coming, and thank you to Corpus Christi for allowing us to use the auditorium. I'll um, get straight to it and introduce the speakers. So on my far right is Colin Brewer. He's a retired psychiatrist and ex-research fellow at Birmingham. He's a medical journalist and author of several books. Um, he's written for The Spectator, The Guardian, and The New Humanist Journal. And he has a keen interest in, history, in, in the history and origins of religions. Alex O'Connor, to my right, is an Oxford University student here with us. Uh, he's got an extremely popular YouTube channel who, um, on which he discusses politics, philosophy, science, and religion. To my far left is Mohammed Hijab. He's an academic researcher at SOAS in London, um, and he's also studied in multiple Islamic institutions. Um, I see Mohammed as a kind of public debater. He roams around London, locking horns with Jews, Muslims, Christians, and atheists, alike, and as I'm sure you'll all attest if you've seen his YouTube channel, um, those are most productive conversations that he's had. Um, Abdullah and Al Andalusi is an international activist for Islam and Muslim Affairs. He's given extensive talks and written articles rationally critiquing, critiquing secularism, liberalism, secular democracy and materialism. He's also the co-founder of the Public Discussion Forum, the Muslim Debate Initiative, um, that promotes open dialogue and critical thought. Um, and without further ado, I'll ask one of the proposition to step up um, supporting the motion, Islam explains reality better than atheism. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. In the name of God, the gracious, the merciful. I'd like to thank the Oxford Forum and my fellow panellists for facilitating this debate and everyone here for attending. I used to be Christian. My mother was Catholic and my father was secular. I went to a Church of England school and learned the basics of Christian belief. However, with there being so many belief systems, I asked myself a question. How did I know I was born into the correct one? Would I have been something different if I was born and raised elsewhere? I then studied every belief, claim, or worldview I could find to discover the ultimate explanation for all things. In doing so, I found that many explanations couldn't account for many things that I could observe or prove themselves false or fell apart due to their own self-contradictions or contradictions between what they say and reality. For example, I encountered Trinitarian Christianity, which argues that God is both one and three, and that the infinite, immortal God is also a finite, mortal man. I encountered polytheists, who argued that there are many gods, some eternal, some who popped out of nothing, who are all infinite but have created and finite human um, or animal forms, suffer ignorance, tiredness, and even injury. Some Pacific Island religions consider volcanoes who to created their island and whose sent, uh, sediments make the ground highly fertile for cultivation to be also eternal and divine. I've also found that many atheistic positions are not any more special or more coherent than these. For example, many materialistic worldviews um, uh, argue that the universe which we see, is f which is finite, limited and changing, is also somehow infinite and eternal at the same time. You just can't see it. Other atheist positions argue that the universe ultimately popped out of nothing, albeit with precisely measured amounts of energy, but no cause to determine that measure. Of course, there are also atheistic worldviews like types of Buddhism, which goes to show that atheism doesn't preclude spirituality, just God. When I encountered Islam, I found something different. That Islam describes God as a being of infinite or inexhaustible power, and who possesses intentionality or will. He has no human or animal attributes, forms, natures, or appetites. Islam teaches that God is genderless, does not experience tiredness or ignorance, and exists without peer. Surah Ikhlas of the Quran makes clear, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Say, God is one, Allahu samid. The self-sufficient, lem yalid wa lem yulid. He does not reproduce, nor was he reproduced. There is nothing like him, which means he is without partner, because if there were other infinite gods, they would all limit each other and all would not be infinite or gods at all. 
This is the Islamic concept of God, a pure, indivisible oneness, a, a cause and initiator for all things, a divine unity behind the multitude of created things. And it is the only explanation that is without contradictions and circular reasoning and does not need to appeal to any mystery to hide faults it simply doesn't have. Islam's message to mankind is to avoid the error of mixing the infinite and the finite together and creating false idols by attributing to limited and finite things the attributes that belong only to the creator and vice versa. Instead, Islam asks mankind to recognize the infinite alone as the ultimate creator of all things, who is separate from his creation and not like it. Is this a God peculiar to Islam? No. Anyone on earth today, or in history, who worships an infinite, unlimited creator, who willed all things into existence and does not resemble any finite things or creatures, worships the same God we do, whatever religion they call themselves. Islam teaches that it is not something new, but merely a reiteration of the same message that has been repeatedly sent down to mankind throughout different times and places, producing commonalities in many religions throughout history. Now to the title of the debate, Islam explains reality better than atheism. Some might say, well, atheism doesn't seek to explain anything. It's only a lack of belief of God or a rejection thereof. But atheism's denial of the existence of God carries the minimum corollary that reality is completely explainable without God. And they'd be wrong in my estimation. There are four aspects of reality that only Islam's concept of God can ultimately and soundly explain, while atheism cannot do so without falling into self-contradiction. And these aspects are change, matter, finitude, and specificity. Atheism rejects the only sound explanation for change. If this moment depended on an infinite number of previous moments and movements, we'd never exist or get here. If I were to say that my opponents can begin their speech after an infinite amount of time, they would never have the chance to start their speeches, as an infinite amount of time can't end or even begin, if you think about it. Likewise, if I asked a poor student, not pointing to anyone in particular, uh, for one pound and he didn't have it, and he asked another who was equally poor, and so on and so on, I'd never get that one pound until the chain of students found at least one student who had one pound to begin the chain of lending and eventually get to me. Now this is known as the infinite regress fallacy, which is the same as asserting a beginning and no beginning at the same time. It is a contradiction and therefore impossible. The existence of change and movement requires a first mover. There's no way around that. And if there is and if it is the first mover, it means it chose to move things without being moved by anything else. Therefore, it has a will. This is the key characteristic of God, whose name is Al-Mubdi, the, uh, the initiator in the Quran. Two, atheism rejects the only sound explanation for the ultimate basis behind matter. If matter gets its attributes and characteristics because it is made from something more fundamental than it, let's just say subatomic particles and forces, ultimately quarks and bosons, and these things are made of, let's say, quantum vacuum energy or, uh, or fluctuations in, in such thing, or super strings, one or the other for the sake of argument, what is quantum vacuum energy, or what are super strings, if they even exist, made of? If something else, and that's made of something else, where does it stop? If it has no end, then nothing would exist. It's like saying a branch is held aloft from the ground by an infinitely tall tree, or a pond has no bottom to hold up the water, despite the water being at a specific level. The fact that anything exists and continues to exist proves there must be something fundamental that is supporting all these things that itself isn't made of anything else and has no parts and therefore is self-sustaining. The Quran calls God Al-Razaq, the sustainer, Al-Hafid, the preserver, Al-Samad, the self-sufficient. Three, atheism rejects the only sound explanation for finite things. If something has size, shape, charge, or a specific characteristic, what determined these limitations in the first place? If it were determined by a finite thing outside itself, an efficient cause, going on forever, it's an infinite regress fallacy. If it was determined by the building blocks inside itself, a material cause going on forever into smaller and smaller blocks, it's another infinite regress fallacy. The only possibility left is that all forms and limited characteristics of all finite things were ultimately created by something 
that has no finite limitations itself, i.e. something infinite, which has no limits that need determining by something else and therefore is the ultimate or necessary thing and it creates all other things. The Quran calls God Al-Khaliq, the creator. Four, atheism rejects the only sound explanation for the specificity of finite things. Things in the universe, including the magnitude of the forces of gravity, strong, weak and force and electromagnetism and the amount of energy contained in the universe are specific to a certain magnitude, size, quantity and quality. Considering that the universe could have one quark more than it has, the question is what determined it would be one way and not another? Perhaps the conditions prior to the universe's emergence, shall we say, led to the conditions we see now. But this only shifts the burden of explanation further along the chain. What then determined the precise pre-existing conditions before the universe that led to our universe being the way it is? If we invoke an infinite chain of pre-existing conditions to explain our current condition or the condition of the emergence of the universe, this is yet again another infinite regress fallacy, I'm afraid. The only remaining explanation is that something ultimately chose or determined by its will all things to be the way they are. The Quran calls God al-Musawwir, the shaper. Islam posits that God ultimately created and sustained all things. He is infinite, unlimited and self-sustaining and he alone, he alone measured out the numbers of things and apportioned all the regularities or what you call natural laws behind all things. It is the Islamic concept of God that not only explains reality better than atheism, but it is the only explanation ultimately that can explain reality that we see, which does not possess self-contradictions, circular logics, or appeals to mystery or blind faith. The arguments of atheists, in my experience, are no different to those I've encountered from polytheists, trinitarians, or volcano worshippers. Atheists just call their god the universe, which essentially is just a bigger volcano. Thank you. Thank you, um, Abdullah. Can I have uh, someone from side opposition to go and speak? Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. I'd also like to extend my gratitude to the Oxford Forum for making this happen. Um, I did have some things to say in preparation, but one thing that we have to understand before we can even begin this discussion is, a co is the concept of the burden of proof. Um, I did have some things to say, like, 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 I, like I mentioned, uh, but I think I'd rather just tackle some of the misrepresentations that I think we've just seen of, of the position of atheism. The first is uh, a rather important case, which is do we actually have anything to prove as, as non-believers uh, in God? Atheism, as uh, Abdullah quite rightly suggests, is thought of uh, by many as simply a lack of belief in God. And the point was raised that no, that can't be the case because a lack of belief in God entails some belief in the opposite, or at least a belief uh, in, in a universe that, that can be uh, explained without God. This isn't the case. Atheism is a claim to belief. A, it, it comes from the Greek, a meaning without, theos meaning God. It simply means living your life without the influence uh, of a God. It's not an active position to hold. Many people would call it agnosticism because we're simply saying, well, there's no good reason to believe in a God, but we're not saying that we believe there isn't one. Uh, but agnosticism is a claim to knowledge. Gnosticism is knowledge. Theism is belief. I simply say, I don't know, therefore I don't believe. Whereas the, the proposition seem to, be, seem, seem to have to say that uh, they also don't know because nobody can know for certain, and yet they do believe. And what we need to see tonight in order to agree with the proposition and have them win the debate is the reason why they're able to take that extra step that we simply can't. So let me explain with an analogy um, that comes from a friend of mine called Matt Delahunty, who has given the example of a gumball, uh, a jar of gumballs. What is, what's essentially happening here is we've got a jar of gumballs, and we have no idea how many gumballs are in the jar. And the people to my right are pointing it and saying there are an even number of gumballs in that jar. And I say, you have no good reason to believe that. I don't believe you. And they say, oh, so, so you might, that entails that you think there's an odd number. Well, of course it doesn't. It just means I don't believe that there's an even number. Just because I don't believe that there's a God doesn't mean I do believe that there's not one. And that's an important point to, to make clear because it demonstrates the fact that the burden of proof lies with the proposition. Uh, if you, ladies and gentlemen, are not convinced by either side in the debate this evening, then the default position has to be atheism. The default position has to be there's no good reason to believe either way. And so we simply don't believe in Islam. 
that's why the, the title of the debate is something of a, of a false dichotomy. Um, but the burden of proof certainly lies with, with the proposition. But that's, that's not a problem, because there were, some, there, were, there were a number of arguments put forward uh, in an attempt to try and fulfill uh, that proof, which it's worth briefly, uh, briefly touching on. For instance, when you bring up the point, Abdullah, about matter, um, you ask the question, what are superstrings made of? Talking about, I, I presume, the kind of quantum strings that are thought to be, according to string theory, at the basis of the universe. And you say, essentially, well, what are these made of? And, and what would that be made of? And what would that be made of? Well, the answer is quite simple. It's, I don't know, and neither do you. And that's the point. Neither of us know. And so I'm simply saying that because we have no reason to know what's at the basis of this reality, what's at the basis of matter, uh, the best thing we can do is throw up our hands and say, until good evidence comes along to believe uh, that it is due to some kind of divine supernatural creator, let's not do so. And certainly, let's not uh, instill that, that uh, supernatural creator with certain qualities um, that are an extra leap of faith that you, you, can't, even, you, you can't take that extra step before you've uh, made, made the first um, also, in, in the point of, on the point of change, uh, you talk about infinite regress, um, which is problematic. Of, of course, the problem of everything needing a cause, everything needing a, a, an explanation for its existence, whether you frame it as a contingency argument or a, a cosmological argument, of course, trivially uh, applies to, to the creator himself, what caused the creator, of course, unless um, you adopt something of a, of, a, of a Kalam cosmological argument that says that, well, we're not talking about uh, everything needing a cause because, of course, like I say, it would trivially, uh, trivially include the creator of the universe. Instead, it's things that begin to exist that need a cause. It's things that have some kind of, uh, that, that, that have some kind of cause that brings them into existence. The fact of the matter is we have no experience with that. You say that there are, there are atheists who believe that things can come out of nothing. Um, there's no good reason to think that something can't come out of nothing. People often say it's ridiculous to suggest that something can come from nothing. You're not all worried that a, a hippo has just materialized in your living room while you're out here. But your living room isn't nothing. In fact, there's no nothing in the universe. Lawrence Krauss has shown that if you take away, or written that if you take away every piece of matter from a, a finite space, and you remove not just the matter, but the radiation, and, and everything that we can conceivably call matter, it still weighs something. Now, that might be a, a practical limitation. Perhaps there is nothing somewhere, and we just haven't been able to access it or, or create it by removing uh, the sufficient matter in the universe. But the fact of the matter is we have no experience with nothing. And so to say something can't come from nothing is an unjustifiable claim. We've never had any nothing to try it with. In fact, the only time there was nothing, if there was nothing ever at all, must have been before the universe was created. And so the only thing that has actually begun to exist in any meaningful sense is the universe itself. And if the argument is that everything that begins to exist has some kind of cause, and so the universe must have some kind of cause, well, everything that begins to exist is the universe. So when you say everything that begins to exist needs a cause, you're just saying the universe needs a cause. And the conclusion is, of course, that the universe has a cause. And that's the definition uh, of a circular argument. Now, that's the first point. The, the second thing I'd like to, 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 to do, I'm not sure how long I've, I've been up here now, I haven't got a, a good track on time. How long have I got? Five minutes, okay, so about halfway through. So let me, let me uh, put to you some of the things that I was thinking of, of uh, putting forward. Did I not have anything to respond to in the propositions case? Uh, I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of discussion of metaphysics this evening. There's going to be a lot of discussion of, of arguments for the existence of God, the existential arguments, let's call them. Um, and so I wanted to, to take a brief moment to bring up what might seem like an irrelevancy, but is certainly not. Islam teaches that there is an objective basis to morality in the world. That when you say something is right or wrong, that is a true statement. And that's as true as something like the, the proposition that the earth orbits the sun. It is a matter of fact. Uh, and that means that part of the reality that we're trying to describe with the Islamic worldview is moral realism. There has to be moral truths that are as real as the metaphysical claims that it's making. And what that means, ladies and gentlemen, is that if you find moral claims within the doctrines of Islam that you don't agree with, then you don't agree with Islam. So I want to consider some of the moral uh, elements of this religion and see if it's something that you would be able to throw your weight behind. Um, there are, of course, many, uh, many examples that I, that I could choose from, but one of the most uh, important areas and one of the most often spoken about areas is the treatment of women. Now, this is problematic because a lot of the time people will point to practical examples. They'll say, look at Saudi Arabia. Women weren't able to drive until very recently, but this is ridiculous. Saudi Arabia can quite easily be shown to not be a real uh, is Islamic state, and it's very easy to make a case that that's the state and not the religion. So let's turn to the doctrine itself. Let's turn to the scripture. What do we find? Well, there's a very famous verse in the Quran, and I'm sure this is nothing that the proposition hasn't come up uh, against before, but I'd like to hear some kind of justification for these things, uh, and I'm sure they'll be able to provide them. Um, the, in the Quran, uh, Surah 4, 
verse 34, I'm sure you're familiar with, is uh, the verse which I'll, I'll, I'll quote to you. Um, men, in, men are in charge of women by right of what Allah has given one over the other and what they spend for maintenance from their wealth. So righteous are women who are devoutly obedient, guarding in their husband's absence what Allah would have them guard. But those wives from whom you fear arrogance, first advise them, then if they persist, forsake them in bed. And finally, strike them. But if, you were, but if they obey you, seek no means against them. Indeed, Allah is ever exalted and grand. So what we have is a situation where the wife is disobedient. Of course, first, you, you try to talk them out of it. Um, secondly, you stop having sex with them. But in that way, it doesn't work. But they didn't strike them. Now, OK. Perhaps this isn't a thing about women. Perhaps this is just a thing about uh, violent behavior. It's just about striking people who are disobedient, and not even disobedient to the husband, but disobedient to God. If, if someone's being disobedient to God, then they need to be set right. And perhaps the only way to do that sometimes is with physical violence. Well, okay, if that's the case, then let's look at a comparison from Hadith, reported by uh, Al-Hakim, uh, on disobedient men. So this is in reference to wives talking, talking about their husbands. She should not beat him in case she is stronger than he. If he, is more, if he is more in the wrong than she, she should plead with him until he is reconciled. If he accepts her pleading, all well and good, and her plea will be accepted by Allah. Well, if he is not reconciled with her, her plea will have reached Allah in any case. So if a woman is disobedient to a man or disobedient to a god, uh, whichever, frame you, whichever framework you want to think about it, uh, the first thing that the, 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 the wife should do, if, if the man is disobedient, is to try and talk him out of it. And if that doesn't work, it's not a problem, because Allah's going to hear it anyway. But if a wife's disobedient to a husband, then sure, he should, uh, she, he should still try and talk her out of it. But if that doesn't work, well, then you can strike them. Seems to be a bit of an inequality here. And that inequality, inequality is only highlighted when we look at the rest of that same hadith. Uh, it, it's preceded by the following. Uh, it is not lawful for a woman who believes Allah to allow anyone... Uh, it is not lawful for a woman who believes in Allah to allow anyone in her husband's house while he dislikes it. Okay, well... Back in the times that this book was written, um, men were primarily the owners of wealth, so it makes sense if the man is the owner of the property, perhaps it should be his decision who's allowed on the property. That's not so much a problem. But let's continue. She should not go out of the house if he dislikes it, and should not obey anyone who contradicts his orders. It's getting a bit more questionable now. And to finish off uh, the very next sentence is, she should not refuse to share his bed. And you can take that to mean what you will. But I'll remind you that if you find any of this objectionable, then you should find objectionable the doctrines from which um, they spring. Another thing I'd like to talk about, and uh, I'm certain, um, because I've certainly seen Mr. Hijab respond to this in the past, and it's something I'd love to dive into, um, is the marriage of the Prophet to Aisha, as uh, certainly the, the Muslim members of our audience this evening will be aware of, but perhaps not everybody. Uh, Muhammad, while in his 50s, married a young girl called Aisha. And I say young, she was six at the time. Not 16 or 60, but six. Now, of course, he didn't, he didn't consummate the marriage when she was six years old. That would be quite outrageous. He waited another three years until she was nine. And the proposition has to defend the idea that that was ever morally permissible. Uh, and I think that's my time. Is that my time? Yes. Well, that's all I've got, but believe me, I have more. So uh, we'll leave it for the rebuttal stage. But thank you. Um, if the next speaker on proposition, uh, Mohammed, thank you. I want to thank everyone for coming today. Thank you very much for coming. It's the uh, first day of Ramadan for us, and we're happy to have you. Now, I've come here, me and Abdullah, actually, we've come here to refute magic. Wait a minute, what did you say? Let me say that one more time. We've come here to refute magic. It's actually a an interesting magic trick where there is no bunny, there's no hat, and in fact there's no magician at all. It's the proposition that something can come from nothing, not only from nothing ladies and gentlemen, but from nothing and by nothing. The Quran says, أَمْ خُلِقُوا مِنْ غَيْرِ شَيْءٍ أَمْ هُمُ الْخَالِقُونَ أَمْ خَلَقُوا السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ بَلْ لَا يُقِنُونَ Were they created from nothing? Or were they themselves the creators of themselves? Now we've heard Alex today, for the second time I've heard him say this, he says that the universe may have come into existence from nothing. Minute 14 to 15 in his video, Does the Universe Have a Cause? He says, when the universe came into existence, it well and truly came into existence from nothing. 
Now, wait a minute. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a challenge. That's an active claim. He said, I'm not here to make any active claims. Sorry, that is an active claim. Look at the syntax of that particular sentence. You are saying the universe came into existence from nothing. Don't, pr don't pretend to be passive. Oh, I'm, I don't know. No, you do know. You're making a statement. Either you know what you're saying or you don't. Tell me how the universe came into existence from nothing and by nothing, ex nihilo. I want to know. Tell me how that's possible metaphysically, ontologically, cosmologically, from first principles. Give me the answer, please. But it's interesting because in his other video, Something From Nothing, where he was debating the contingency argument with a fellow American, or an American man, minute 48, he says this, listen to this. He agrees with the, the radio guy that was speaking to him that the universe is a necessary existence. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What's going on here, ladies and gentlemen? What does necessary existence mean? A necessary, of, a necessary fact is a fact that cannot be any other way. 2 plus 2 equals 4. That's eternally going to be the case. So a necessary existence is eternal. It cannot be any other way. So wait a minute. If the universe is eternal, how could it come from nothing? Contradiction. It's a contradiction. You can't have it both ways, my friend. And this is what atheism leads you to. Contradictory set of propositions. Either you have your cake or you want to eat it, what are you going to do with it? Tell me now, did the universe come from nothing? If so, how so? That's an active claim. Is the universe a necessary existence? If so, how so? That is an active claim. Is it eternal? Just, come on, please. Don't pretend to be innocent and agnostic. Number two. You could say, no, there's a multiverse, or there's an eternal fabric, or there's an eternal universe. But a multiverse has the propensity of being any other way. And, I'm sure you study philosophy, you know what you're talking about. A possible existence, or a contingent existence, is defined by being able to be rearranged in any other way. If it can be arranged in another way, it's not necessary. It's possible or contingent. It's not necessary. So a multiverse cannot be necessary existence because it can be arranged in another way. It can be out of existence. So wait a minute. This is very important, guys. Hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. You agree that there should and ought, be, ought to be a necessary existence. If you agree with me on that, then you're not an atheist. Because the necessary existence is the Islamic definition of God. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Say he is one and only. The self-sufficient, the independent. Meaning, the necessary existence. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not nor is he begotten. Meaning he's eternal. If you say that there's a necessary existence, you cannot say you're an atheist. From an Islamic perspective. And from a philosophical one, moreover, we have to ask a question now. We're talking about Islam. So, why is Islam any different from any other religion? Because Islam talks about one necessary existence, one independent, one self-sufficient. Not three in one, one in three. Not a triune God, not a multiplicity of gods, a plethora of gods. Not a pantheism. And by the way, I have to make this clear now. It was a bit of a straw man argument because Alex came up and says that Abdullah said that the universe has a cause. He never said that in the statement. But he had these pre, you know, written things. We never use the word cause. You can have a necessary existence. You can make an ontological argument for a necessary existence without causation at all. There's a difference between possibility and contingency on the one hand or necessity and causation. You don't even need to, you can have it. You don't, you don't believe in causation before the universe? Co uh, comp a fallacy of composition? Have it, no problem. You have to explain how there can be a world with only possible existences. How can there be a world with only possible existences? If you say there can't be, and we're happy to say there's a necessary existence, you're no longer an atheist from an Islamic perspective. Because you believe in an independent, self-sufficient thing that everything depends upon. And that is the ultimate explanation for all of all of existence. 
Now, a secondary point we need to make is that Islam, the concept of God, the Tawheed, the monotheism, is something not only intuitive, but it's something, as we've seen, that can be reasoned from first principles, ladies and gentlemen. And that's why, already when we just look at the concept of God, so many of the major world religions are ruled out. Christianity is ruled out. Hinduism is ruled out. I would say Sikhism is ruled out. Why? Because of that pure monotheism, that, that respectable monotheism that Islam has to offer. But in addition to that, as Abdullah alluded to, the meta-narrative of there being many prophets aforetime, many of them with the same message of Islamic monotheism, believing in one God and worshiping one God, is something which can be seen in the religious books. What Abraham said, what Moses said, what did they come and say? Even according to Old Testament literature, calling the people to monotheism. So, Islam also has an inbuilt system of falsification. It works in a similar way to science in many ways. Four challenges, which I'm happy to take questions on, the questions and answer, or in the cross-examination. One, if this book was from other than God, the Quran says about itself, there would have been many contradictions. Chapter 4, verse 92. Number two, the inimitability challenge. Try and produce something like it. And there is a quantifiable way of doing so, which we can talk about in the question and answers. Number three, that Islam makes predictions about the future. And it specifies time and place. And it's, this is my claim. It's the only religion to make a series of predictions about the future, none of which have not materialized. Whereas with anyone you want to mention who makes predictions of the future, at least some of their predictions will be falsified. And I'm willing to be tested on this. Test it. It's falsifiable. And in fact, this falsifiability is even stronger than the scientific one. Why? Because in scientific falsifiability, everything is susceptible to falsifiability. You, everything that's done now, if I do a scientific experiment, now it can be falsified. But with a retrospective perspective, a hindsight perspective, if predictions have been made of the future, we can see whether those predictions are right or wrong. And we can talk about those predictions of, there's a book coming out called The Forbidden Prophecies by Aira. That's going to be something which details that case in detail. Now the interesting thing is you have a nihilist, someone who does not believe in existential, uh, he's, he's an existential nihilist who's cosmic skeptic. He's an existential nihilist, a moral nihilist. He is an epistemological nihilist. He doesn't even believe in morality. And he's making a moral case today. I mean, I don't know how this works. I really don't know. He says, I subjectively value my liberty. In one of his videos, The Moral Argument, one hour, 16 minutes. L tell me how, from first principles, liberty works. Is it not based and predicated on a fictitious, hypothetical, mythological state of nature detailed by John Locke and Thomas Hobbes and those individuals? Where's the scientific evidence for that? Why do you believe that? Why do you believe in equality? John Locke established his equality on the hedonistic principle and on a theory of God. Now you're an atheist, try and find from first principles why you believe in equality. We, as Muslims, don't believe in second-wave feminism. Simple as that. Yeah, there are some things in Islam which are different from men than to women. Why do I have to justify myself to you? You have to justify why that equality, of the six, that Eurocentric understanding of equality of second-wave feminism in the 60s that emerged, is the objective morality. That's you, that's an active claim that you've made. You have to substantiate it. But listen to what he says in his video, My Problem with Sam Harris's Morality. It, can I finish off? Yeah, yeah, you've got a minute left. If you go to Somalia and tell those women, why do you put those women in bags? They will accuse you of cultural imperialism. So why are you asking the women if they've been put in bags? What kind of discussion is that? What kind of sanctimonious orientalist understanding of morality is that? You have to first prove your morality. You're an objective, you're a subjective moralist. You don't believe in objective morality. Don't ask me about morality. You don't believe in it. Prove it. That's an active claim. And with that, guys, I want to say one last thing, which is that he made an egregious claim in one of his videos called The Liberal Hypocrisy on Islam. He said Islam is a racist religion. And I will tell you that Islam is the only religion in the ancient religion in the world which completely negates racism. Look at chapter 49, verse 13 of the Quran. Look at the Prophet. He said there's no virtue of a black man over a white man, an Arab over a non-Arab. Now, he's got three options. Option one, to retract the statement. Option two, 
Yes, option two, to provide the evidence, or option three, face public humiliation today. And there's no fourth option. So don't make claims about morality and about Islam if you haven't even read the Islamic literature and you don't know what is in its contents. Sorry for the, I know it's quite a, you know, performance, but it's a very strong, it's a passionate topic for us. I hope I'm thanking everyone here. And I also thank Cosmic Skeptic for coming and for once speaking to the Muslim community rather than about them. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for that, Mohammed. Um, now can we hear from Colin Brewer? <coughs> I'm a bit of an amateur at this. These guys are all more or less professional. Um, I wish I was as certain of anything as the people on this side of the table seem to be of absolutely everything. And I want to start by not singling out Islam particularly, because Islam is just one of those monotheisms that seems to find atheism terribly worrying. I mean, all, whether, whether the theistic religions believe in one god or many gods, they're terrified of people who don't believe in any gods. And when they have the power to do so, and in the case of Christianity, when they had the power to do so, they routinely try to silence people like me, by, at best, by censorship, at worst, by imprisonment, exile, or execution. And... You know, there's nothing particularly Islamic about this. Uh, Christianity was executing people just for being the wrong sort of Christian before Islam was a twinkle in, in Muhammad's eye. And they continued to do so until 1826, which was when the Spanish Inquisition uh, executed its last victim. Here, uh, I want to quote you a couple of worried Christians talking about atheism in the 17th century. One of them was a, uh, both French theologians. One of them said, I am afraid that atheist writings will disclose thoughts to me that would throw me into a fear from which I would not be able to return. And his contemporary, André d'Abillon, said that for such skeptics, there is no punishment violent enough for so dark a crime. Um, even in our own relatively tolerant country, when Parliament was open to people who were not members of the Church of England, guess who came last? First of all, they let the Catholics in, about 1829. They let the Jews in, about 1850. They let atheists in, about 1880. So, uh, Christianity no longer has any power to liquidate people who question it, and almost everybody in Britain and most civilised countries is pleased about that. I'll explain what I mean by civilized in a moment. Islam has not lost that power. Um, not only that, but many people in Islamic countries, and in some Islamic countries, most of the people, are very pleased that it has the power to do very nasty things to atheists. The Islamic countries were the only ones who refused to sign the part of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 that said that uh, that deals with freedom of religious belief, including the freedom to change your religion or not to have one. And that's why I think that such countries are, in one very important sense, not totally, not altogether civilized. Um, last year, I was asked by uh, a professor of English at the university in one of the more liberal Arab countries if I would write an article for his small Arab language departmental journal on Sigmund Freud's use of language. It will be published soon. I'm very proud of it. It will be my first work to be published in Arabic. But it has one very important omission. Uh, soon after I started writing it, I thought I'd better check with him whether it was okay to mention that Freud was an atheist. He said, if you do that, they will immediately close down the journal and possibly my department as well. Now, um, you don't really persuade me that you get a better grip on reality when you spend your time trying to 
stop people from giving their views on various aspects of reality. And when you outlaw discussion about what reality might mean. And whatever we mean by reality, I suggest there are two broad types of reality. One is historical reality, which means an attempt to find out what really went on in the past. And the other sort of reality is current reality, things that we can examine, question now. Um, so let's deal with historical ones first. Uh, a few years ago, I was on holiday in uh, Morocco, and we, uh, we hired a driver to take us around, and it was quite a long drive. He was, um, he'd been to university in Britain, his English was excellent, and naturally enough, we, uh, the discussion turned to Islam, and he was very keen to tell us his, his thoughts. And I learned from him that um, it is completely wrong that Jesus was the Son of God, and that he died on the cross. Now, these are the fundamental tenets of Christianity. They don't get any more uh, fundamental than that. And he said that um, probably, and this is, there's a lot, certain amount of debate about this in, in, in among Islamic scholars, that it may have been actually Judas, suitably disguised, who died on the cross. Now, um, not, being, um, uh, not being a theist, um, I, uh, I don't particularly care uh, which of them is right. They cannot both be right. Either Jesus died on the cross or he, he did not die on the cross, and either he was Jesus or he was Judas. But they cannot both be right. They can, however, both be wrong. And uh, that, that is the problem when you start insisting that things written in ancient documents must be believed without any question. There is actually a lot of questioning to be done about the origins of the Quran. Um, there is very little documentary evidence about, for about 200 years. Christianity is bad enough because there is nothing about Christianity that dates from earlier than about 40 to 60 years after the crucifixion. Um, and we know how difficult it is to be certain about events that happened 20, 30 years ago, people have ferocious arguments about the Second World War, about all the various other wars that have happened since. So uh, when you're making claims with the kind of certainty we have seen from this side of the table about historical events, uh, when even the history of the Quran is shrouded in quite a lot of mystery, and when you threaten people with, uh, uh, with serious sanctions if they try and do research on it, that, to me, does not say very much about your desire to get to grips with reality. Uh, it was not permitted to do serious historical research on, on the Bible until about the end of the 18th century. You could still be sent to prison in Britain for denying the Trinity as late as about 1812. But eventually in the 19th century, serious higher criticism, as it was called, of the Bible appeared. And now people are very much less certain that everything said in the, new, in the Old and New Testaments is actually true in every respect, to put it mildly. The Catholic Church didn't allow that until about 1941, and Islam does not allow it still. Uh, Islamic scholars uh, have found their careers seriously threatened if they really tried to get to grips with some of the, uh, the mysteries of the early versions of the Quran and, and so forth. So, let's turn now to, how am I doing for time? About halfway? Two minutes. Oh, you didn't, that's right, all right. Um, I didn't hear the halfway mark. Uh, let's turn very quickly then to reality as is current. Um, uh, a few years ago, I got into um, some discussion with a Dr. Majid Katme, who describes himself as the spokesman for the Islamic Medical Association of the United Kingdom on Medical Ethics. And uh, we, I was interested about Islam's line on abortion. And he wrote to me saying, uh, because obviously one of the issues in abortion is when 
when does the fetus become, uh, become human, when does the fetus gain the kind of status where its destruction uh, becomes increasingly important. Um, and he said, um, at six, uh, quoting him directly, at six to seven weeks of pregnancy, the soul is breathed in, in the body of the fetus. Divine human life starts when the embryo turns into a fetus. Okay, so uh, that's relatively clear. It's not a human being until, um, until it turns into, into a fetus. At this critical stage, it's absolutely forbidden to interfere with this new sacred life. One can call the fetus here a persona, human and divine. However, there's wide Muslim opinion in the Muslim world, uh, considered by many Muslim scholars in the past. Uh, and uh, some of them say that ensoulment occurs 120 days after conception. Personally, I and other Muslims do not agree with this view, based on a wrong Arabic interpretation of one saying of the Prophet. And then he said, this important saying of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when 42 nights have passed over the, the nuft, nutfa, the fertilized egg, Allah sends an angel to it who shapes it and makes its hearing, vision, skin, flesh and bones. And then he says, O oh Lord, is it male or female? And your Lord decides what he wishes and the angel records it. He gives the reference in the hadith. So okay, there it is. Forget all that ludicrous stuff about Y chromosomes and gender. It's Allah what does it, it uh, and uh, uh, maybe someone should ask the Muslim Council of Great Britain if they really want someone like that advising them on medical matters. Um, yes, I will finish there. Thank you. Thank you very much for that comment. Um, is there any argument on this side that you particularly want to address um, from these two gentlemen, am I right? Um, yeah, you know I'll just go with the comment to myself then, and we'll start off. Yeah. Uh, and just... so, so basically, I think may, maybe my, my colleague is used to debating uh, perhaps some uh, certain Christians and what have you. Um, I'd like to think that perhaps we're a slightly different breed in terms of our let's, uh, approach or philosophical approach. I don't think he addressed actually what I said, and I think straw man my argument, for example, I'll give you an example. So I never said everything that begins to exist has a cause. I never used that because the, you could always say, well, how do you know everything does begin to exist? And that would require empirical verification, which is what I never, that's why I never said it in the first place. I merely posited that ultimately, and I don't know where, the, where this ultimately is. I just said ultimately there will be a cause. I don't know how old the universe is. Maybe we've been through a couple, of, you know, six or seven big bangs and big crunches and, until getting to this point. Of course, the universe is everything that exists. I merely said that at some point it has to start somewhere because an infinite regress would mean there would be no change, no creation, nothing. And the same for things like what, what matter is composed of. I never made an, an assumption that it is quantum vacuum energy or superstrings, which a lot, of people, a lot of scientists now doubt the idea of superstring theory, a bit fantastical, but, but I, I just posit those, those two, like, say whatever you want. The question can always be asked, what are they made out of? What are they made out of? If their attributes are, come from what's, uh, something, what they're made out of, for example, then what can, you, you, what can they be made out of? Until you get to the point where there must be something that's fundamental, a, a fundamental substratum that supports all reality's existence. Uh, that, and if it's fundamental and it's necessary, then it wouldn't be limited and it would be self-sufficient because it wouldn't re require anything prior to it or underneath it or further more fundamental than itself. So these are the kind of the arguments I made, but I, I guess just to kind of uh, reframe this discussion in terms of what I mean by atheism or why I'm, I mentioned the term atheism. Um, you're right, atheism isn't a belief, but I posited that it carries a necessary corollary, something attached to it which is, if you don't believe in God's existence, not that you may be just, uh, it's just your default, no, if you don't believe in God's existence, that means that your worldview does not require you to posit God to explain things. And I really posited that reality imposes certain uh, problems if you want to keep God out of that discussion because ultimately you can't explain cause, matter, specificity, uh, or limited and finite things. And my explanation isn't one where I've known, I know stuff because I've observed it, is that God is the only explanation to avoid self-contradictions. And that's pretty much it. Like, like I'm saying, if we take two and we add two, 
I know that this will equal 4 because taking the premises, the, 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 the conclusion must follow. So likewise, I know that the premises are the existence of finite things. That's the premises. So I know that eventually at some point it must follow that there must be a beginning point, a creating point, a start point and a fundamental substratum that's supporting all things. Even though I don't know where that is, where the boundary of that is, that's my, my argument. Could you, could you put that into deductive form? Into deductive form? Well, I, I yeah, thought so, I was so, so 2 plus 2 equals 4 is a deductive form. It's a premise yeah. and a conclusion. Uh, it's not deductive form to say there is matter and matter must have a beginning. What's the, what's the deductive argument there? Well, for example, well, it's the um, avoidance of, con of contradiction. So because uh, I, just, I just explained. So if I was to say 2 plus 2 equals 6, right, and 6 meaning what we, what we conventionally understand 6 to be, we know that was wrong because of contradiction. So my point was that if you were to say, well, before us, or before this point in time, there was an infinite number of moments or movements, I would say we would never reach this point in time because it would be a contradiction. I know what he was he's trying it, to it's, get it's one of the longest questions I've ever been asked. I, the, I, th I think you know what I'm saying. The, you're you're trying to say, you want us to say everything that begins to exist has a cause. No, that's not, I, not necessarily the kalam. That's not what I'm going okay. for. What, what well, I'm saying is no. that if you, the reason why you can say that 2 plus 2 equals 6 is false is because you're right, at least for logical contradiction. The reason for that is because it's essentially um, a logically valid argument with premises and conclusions, and you can identify exactly how it contradicts. You can put it into a truth table and show what, that it's 2 false. 2 plus 2 equals 4? Yes. It's it, a tautology, it's, though. 2 plus 2 it, Well, precisely. It's a, yeah. it's a tautology, and you, and you can prove that deductively. Mm -hmm. But there's no... Can you highlight precisely what the premises are and the conclusions are of your argument here? So does you can it, does do it, it need in to be outlined like that? Because the thing it does that if you're going to say that it leads to contradictions if you don't agree with the conclusion. Well, it does because an, infinite, an infinite regress is basically saying that uh, there was no beginning and yet we're explaining, uh, or there, there was no uh, cause and we're explaining the cause of things or explaining the beginning of things or explaining uh, movement. So there was no first movement, but there is movement. So. It, it, it creates a contradiction in terms because, in essence, we rely on a, a pre-existing state or pre-existing um, conditions of movement, and yet ultimately there is no. There's, you're saying there is no beginning to this pre-existing thing. There's just an so eternal, an eternal chain that there is no start I'm, I'm, to it. And therefore, it's the same as saying nothing actually. I'm trying exists. to get you to prove yeah. that we require. Right, so I've got one statement to that can kind of summarize it for you. Anything susceptible to additional subtraction cannot be infinite. Okay. Okay, so that's, it doesn't need to be a, um, a deductive three-stage deduction. Well, no, that be, makes it a deductive. Right, so no, I'm just giving right. one statement. He, what he's saying is that if you have an infinite thing and you add to it, then there's the absurdity of adding to an infinite physical quantitative thing. So you'd have to disprove that statement. Now we've made the statement, anything susceptible to addition or subtraction cannot be, right, cannot be infinite. Mm -hmm. So in order for you to to prove your infinite regress, if you wanted to prove it, you have to prove or you have to show how it's demonstrably possible for something to have infinity as a, as a quality as well as addition and subtraction there as well. No, I don't. Yeah. So then you can't really make any claim. I don't, no, but I'm not making a claim, that's the thing. So I'm then why, why are we having this discussion? Because I'm opposing no. your claims. Well, you can't oppose your that, claim is that it. Your claim is that it requires it, and I'm just asking you why that's the I'm case. I'm saying anything that the, is... The logical form, the, 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 the idea that it is uh, logically necessary to have uh, causation, or, or that there can't no, be. No, we didn't a, say anything there, about causation. There can't be an infinite regress. No, no, I've just said what I've this, said. This. We just have a final statement from you and from you. Yeah, yeah. Just the, 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 the statement. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. apologise. Yeah. The, yeah. the, uh, the statement I made the is that anything susceptible to addition or subtraction cannot be quantita quantitatively infinite. Yes, you have to. You, if you're, if you're rejecting that, you have to disprove that. How is it physically, mathematically, or otherwise? How is it possible to have a quantifiable infinite? which is susceptible to additional subtraction. That's all you have to do. It, it's, a, it's another issue of burden of proof. It's not on me to prove that that's yeah. well, I've just made the claim. It's false. It's you no. to prove that's true, and you failed to do okay, so. Okay, I'll give you because an example. I, right? and if you'll allow me to answer the question, yeah. the, the, the answer is... Can we just is, leave it after this one? Yeah. yeah. The, the, an, the answer territory. is uh, that you're right. Like These things are required okay. according to laws of logic and physics that are predicated on the existence of the universe. And we're talking about the universe... Wait, why is it predicated on the existence of the universe? Because... Can you prove it? Well... No. Okay, so why are you, so why are you making a claim? It's an active claim. It's a possibility, right? No, 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 it's an active claim, which is... And it's, a possi it's not possibility. It's, it's possibly true. Do you know why it's not a possibility? And if, it's, if it's possibly true... No, it's not possible true. Why is it not possible? Because if, if the universe is a possible existence, then it cannot explain the existence of other possible existences. If, if there is a necessary... Uh, Did you get that? Do you understand that? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm asking you a question in return. If, if there is a necessary... No, but can you, can you address that first? If, um, um, this is what I'm trying to do with yeah. the question. If, if there is a necessary being or occurrence, and, and that entails... Which is what you admit. And that... Um, 
and that entails yeah. another occurrence. No, it doesn't entail. Like and, and if it does, if I, no, it doesn't work if, like if that. If I may just, so, 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 if I, I think the confusion is, firstly, I don't think all things require putting into um, a, a logical syllogisms. I yes. don't think it's necessary. They do if yeah. you're going to say that. I'm saying that. I'm they saying do. no, no. It, it does when you're making contrary propositions. You don't it doesn't. A sentence could say that this sentence is false. It creates a contradiction within the sentence without it being a logical sort of syllogism. Yeah, yeah but again, so that, that, that is I, I'm merely, false. I'm merely pointing out that there are um, ultimately only two possibilities yes. to, uh, to basically anything that you might observe which is finite, limited, or what have you, which is yeah. either it was, it was uh, the result of something more fundamental than it or something that, that, sure. that, that is prior to it. Mm -hmm. um, and if you ask, well, what was prior to any, anything, or what is more fundamental to anything, either it's something that's like itself, as in something finite, limited as well, or something not the case, not finite and not limited. So I'm saying that if we go down the pathway of just constantly insisting on there's a, a, a continual chain prior to this existence of finite, limited things, uh, nothing would exist because that would cause an infinite regress fallacy and thereby the contradiction is manifest. As opposed to ultimately at some point saying, well, actually, you know what, at some point, I don't know where, but at some point mm. there was a beginning or there was something that was not finite whereby it doesn't have limitations and just to kind of justify to you limitations requires explanation mm. something that doesn't have limitations doesn't require explanation because there's no limits for it to be uh, there's nothing to create its limits for it to be explained by something else no it still so, requires explanation uh, let's leave no, this no, one yeah. yeah. absolutely okay. 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 Um, yeah. do you want to jump in yeah I want to make a very old simple observation that if you say God created it all, the next obvious question of course is who created God? Um, and Colin, nobody uh, has given a very satisfactory just, just opinion. Please let me finish. Oh, let sorry, me finish. Sorry, sorry. Uh, and uh, the second one is, as I say, uh, you are talking the language of certainty. What we have learned in the course of my lifetime is that the origins of the universe have been pushed further and further back in time. It's a fascinating study. I don't pretend to understand more than the average man in the street about it. But to say that we clearly understand the nature of creation seems to me extremely arrogant. And to pretend that you can speak with certainty about something like that, I think is put it mildly, not justified. Well, I think it's a little arrogant to actually dismiss what we actually said because we never actually claimed that we know every um, tiny particle in this universe or how big it is or where it began. We never actually said that. So, Edith, it, it shows that you weren't listening. I'm just saying that you did. I'm just saying that it shows that you weren't listening to what we were saying and, and some people might say that's arrogant too. Um, what I'm saying is very simply this. Creation or causation or whatever you want to call it is to uh, uh, limit something, to, to define its limitation. Like when you draw a circle, you're, you're drawing a limitation. So limitations require explanation. But if something has no limitation, then there's nothing that requires it to be determined because it has no, there's no, there's no uh, boundaries that exist in it. Is, it is fundamentally uh, uh, unlimited. But you can't, that's you can't that's just why pulse, we say it doesn't require a necessary being and say it doesn't require any explanation. No, no, no we're not pausing I didn't say necessary, I said But that's the opposite of limited. limited. No, because <coughs> limitations require mm. explanation, mm -hmm. right? Not, not the lack thereof. Right? And, and limitation as opposed to what? what what's as the opposed to not, uh, not being limited. And what, is something, no and what is something that's not limited? Well, fine. it's well, necessary it's, because if it's not necessary, then it's limited. What's your definition of necessary? Because you keep using it incorrectly. What, what's your understanding of necessary existence? Well, you know, you were talking about contingent things. It's, no, the, yeah. it's the opposite of that. So, so something can, you, that can, can you give it? So definition? something that cannot have been differently. That cannot, okay, not cannot have be differently, and there's yes. no explanation for it. What outside of itself? Well, I suppose so. Yes, right, right. And okay, so can you can you can you tell us how there can be a world with no necessary existence? Um, well, who says we're you said we're living in a world of possible, or you said that we have to claim that we're living in a world of possible existences. Do you, do you agree that there could be an, uh, that no, could be? Nobody's claimed that. Do you accept that there, there is an, an, an necessary existence? I would say that th yes. Then that's God. That's but that it. doesn't have to be uh, God. Over. Thank it you very does much. Not, no, that does not have to be God. I'm sorry. No, no, no. It does no. Not that's, have our, to be God. that's our understanding of God. Yeah, it I does not have to be yeah, God. Yeah, for us, a necessary existence is something which is this is the perfect. Couldn't be any other way. Explains everything else. That's our definition of God. It explains everything else. Because without, because it's necessary, it couldn't be any other way. All contingent, yeah, it couldn't have been any other way. All that, that's contingent no power. Alex, all contingent things depend upon it. Yes? Give me an example of a contingent thing. Any, this cup. How was it contingent? Because it could have otherwise not been in, in existence. You, do you know you're speaking to a determinist? Pardon? Do you know you're speaking uh, yeah, to okay, a Yeah, okay, so what is determinism? So if, if... You he, said in your, in your thing, sorry. What determined oh, it? Yeah, 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 you, if, you, if, yeah. If, let me ask you a question. It's mostly isolated, but it will make sense. Go ahead. If P entails Q, 
Go and ahead. P is necessary. Yes. Is Q necessary? No. It's not? No. No, no, it's not. It doesn't have to be. If necessary, Sorry, hold so up, hold up. Let me explain why. What we're doing here is we've said that these dependent contingent things... As, yes? as you're defining them. Do you accept that this cup could have otherwise not been in existence? No. So, okay, this, this That's is, what determinism is. Well, hold on. So you believe in the det determinism? Yes. And you said in your, you said in your speech, in your thing, uh, A Universe from Nothing, you said that determinism comes from the necessary existence. Are you, you said this, about the no, 48 the minutes, Riley? yes, 48 minutes in, you said that okay. one necessarily leads from the other. Uh, in other words, determinism leads from necessary existence, yes or no? D sorry, say that again. You said, leads you said determinism leads from necessary existence. Okay, I think we were talking about a different thing. When no, 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 you said this, and I can show you 48 minutes into the video. Yes, I said that yeah. sentence, Perfect. but I meant All a different right. thing so by necessary no, no, hold on. existence. So, no, you know, you said the universe was this, necessary this existence. This can't be a semantic point scoring exercise. I it's meant not. something different by what you're no talking problem, about. No problem, but you said this. You said, and you said, matter. you said determinism comes from the necessary existence. What did I mean by that? I mean, you, I, okay, I I'll tell you what you meant, because I remember exactly, I just listened to this two days ago. The guy asked you, is the universe, would you agree with Bertrand Russell, that the universe just is, yeah? And you replied and said, yeah, the fact that the universe is necessary existence, the, I would agree with that in the first instance. And then he said, how would that uh, tie in with determinism? You then said, determinism follows from, it's that which follows, determinism follows from the necessary existence. Right, which I, I know what you're Do you remember? About. I was taught, so I was, I was, the person I was debating with, a guy called Cameron Batuzzi, yes. he, was making the case, he was making the case with the contingency argument right. that he was saying uh, that there are contingent things in the universe and therefore he was using that to reason that there's a God. And I said that if that were the case, yes. that necessary existence, the, the, yes. the determinism would follow from that. I was making Perfect. the case. Okay. So I didn't I agree say with that you. it does exist. Listen, Alex. I didn't I, say that it does we, exist. We agree with you on that point. So this is the thing. You agree with us on more points than you think you agree with us on. You believe in a necessary existence which explains everything else. No, no necessary existence. Be, be careful. N I, you said a necessary existence. You, are you retracting it? I said that the... the are you retracting it? The universe... That there's not one unified necessary existence. But you, no, no, you said things. that the universe was a necessary... The so are you retracting follow, that? The universe follows a necessary causal chain. Okay, so is, that, is there... I, a, no, I, you said... I, hold on. You said I the universe is a necessary existence, and then you right. said determinism <laughs> follows from that. Now, I'm saying that... Okay, you how about this? If I said that, and I meant what you think I meant by yes. that, then yes, I retract it. But so I you retract that, it. But I don't think that's what you I know, meant. I think what it is, Alex, is that you but keep... people can go and look no, at Alex, themselves. So you're, you're very good at making arguments against things I used to believe in. Okay, so you used to believe in it because... Okay, now it's perfect. we're not on speaker's corner. Okay. No, no, no. Turn it down a bit, right? Argument, counter... No, no, it's important, guys, because if you're changing your argument... Can I have an answer to my question now you've been cornered. That's the only God. reason why you've changed your okay, argument. Okay, I will, Thank I will, you. I'll do that. I was wanted. So the who created God? Colin Bruce. Uh, yeah. Well, we have to actually ask the question: Why does anything need creation in the first place? Right. It's a more fundamental question. Yeah. So, I mean, I could take this club, but I usually sometimes I just take a, a stone or something, and I say, "How do you know that this actually thing was created or required it to be required creation?" So, if this thing was, let's say, eternal or, or let's say uncreated then why is it in this particular shape, form, and so on and so forth that it didn't choose? If something was uncreated and nothing determined its limitations, then it wouldn't have limitations, which is my point. So therefore, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's kind of ridiculous to argue that mm -hmm. um, God requires creation when he has no limits that require mm -hmm. defined by anything to be defined by or determined by something else. Mm -hmm. And that's why we know that anything is created is only because it has limitations. How long right. do you think God's been around for? Eternity. Oh, well, okay. Oh, what I'll say is that there, you know, God is outside of time, so mm -hmm. there's no, there's no uh, pre-existent time before Him, mm -hmm. right? He's the, the beginning. How do you mm -hmm. know? But, but I, you know what? I just, just, just want to kind of just pause and rewind something that you, you mentioned, you mentioned in your, your presentation. I just want to just, uh, just briefly touch on it before we touch yeah. anything else, which is you said that uh, Islam is terrified of of a people professing atheism, mm -hmm. right? Again, I think that uh, I don't know what experience you've had maybe with. Uh, from reading European history books, but I, still, I suppose you should read books from uh, about Mesopotamia and, and Islamic I civilization. The, the Prophet Muhammad, wasalam, let me, if, I, if I may, if I, if I may just finish, I'll let you respond. So the Prophet Muhammad wasalam, uh, had a famous debate with a Bedouin atheist. Right? There was no intolerance there. The, Be the Bedouin atheist actually became Muslim, but there was no intolerance just because 
the guy initially professed to be atheist. Um, Abu Hanifa, famous classical scholar mm. in medieval Iraq, Baghdad mm. actually, mm. had public open air debates with atheists. Mm -hmm. Presumably there's atheists who were living in Baghdad at mm -hmm. the time to actually mm -hmm. be invited to open air debates mm -hmm. and no one killed them or was intolerant to them mm -hmm. at all whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, and when you say, oh, Islam is, is terrified of atheists, I just want to say something. You're not special. We mm. encounter polytheists, we encounter um, uh, mm. Christian uh, Trinitarians, we mm. encounter Zoroastrians mm. throughout our history. Mm. And from our perspective, mm -hmm. you're all arguing exactly the same thing, which mm. is somehow the, the finite thing is, this, is also infinite and eternal. And we don't, really, we don't really see you as different, actually. You're just, an, just another, uh, Pol let's polytheist. say, um, yeah, just another flavor of ice cream that we are basically encountering. So I don't, don't make yourself out to be more, uh, more special than you are from our mm. perspective. Mm -hmm. And as for the issue of, uh, tolerance of atheists, I, I think you should question your founders of your very ideology which pervades the West, uh, liberalism. liberalism. Uh, John Locke in his Letter on Toleration mm -hmm. argued that you should tolerate different Christian sects, uh, yeah. Protestants that, That's basically, right. but not atheists, atheists because you can't yeah. trust what they say, they don't, <laughs> they don't believe in any higher uh, moral value other than mm -hmm. mainly what is expedient. <coughs> Uh, mm -hmm. Rousseau made also the same argument mm -hmm. and some people say mm -hmm. that under the current you could say uh, atheistic idea as opposed to the natural rights arguments uh, of, uh, of John Locke but the Benthamite arguments of utilitarianism mm -hmm. really yeah, morality yeah. is only based on expediency and then people's rights are based on whether it's expedient to the state to even tolerate your rights. So right. now this is not related to the debate itself, but the mm -hmm. guy brought it up and it's really disingenuous to bring up in that kind of uh, yeah, debate. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I mean, are you suggesting that someone like Socrates was a deeply immoral man? No, I'm not saying it. I'm saying no, John Locke is... You seem to be implying... No, no, no. John Locke said that you, that you can't look, trust atheists. The, the, he didn't the, say the that they are necessarily, by default, the, the difference is immoral. that the things, the things which our worldview are, uh, are, are based upon, which are the philosophies of these men, we can say that those areas of their philosophies were wrong. John Locke said some pretty egregious things. The you're a nihilist. How can you say anything? The right difference is, we'll get to that. The difference is. No, you can't say that you're wrong. You're no, not going to grant you that. I, I, think I actually can't. I'm not going to grant you that. Uh, you're, you're, you don't believe in objective the morality. The difference is. The difference is that you can't do the same thing. No, when you can't do it at all. When there is something immoral, you don't believe in when there is something yeah. immoral in the basis, it, when there is something immoral uh, that comes from somebody who founded the worldview that we believe in, and something else unrelatedly that he said that no longer applies was wrong. Can you prove it's immoral? We, we can say that we disagree with can what you he had to say. Can you prove it's immoral on your worldview? We have to. We can say that we disagree what he had to. You're making what an act of claim. So you can't you, do the same thing. You're making an act of claim. When there's immoralities in the Quran, right. you can't make the same. Look, we, we have just allowed you to speak, and there, there were many times I could have interjected and asked you similar questions. And you're making a two core quay fallacy, and you're smart enough to know it. You can't just turn around and say just, that you're just a answer the question, for please. being a moral nihilist, especially since I'm not one anymore. Oh, you've changed your mind now. Yes. Right? So uh, you've tracked that statement so. as well. What, what statement? The, the ones that you said you're a moral nihilist. What, what, what do you think moral subjectivism meant to me and means to me? What do you think I don't it know means what it means to, to you, man. That's what, a subjective so, so statement. You're, say, you're saying you can't say this because you're a moral subjectivist and a moral yeah, nihilist. Yeah, you're making a moral claim. What do you you're think passing that moral means? judgment. What, what is moral subjectivism? Yeah, so it, you don't have objective morality. It's not, it's not fixed. It's not true or false. It's, uh, despite human uh, thoughts or convictions, that morality is, uh, is true. So it's only first okay, person subjective. Let's get a succinct it, answer to that. Yeah, Statement my question, can I ask one question and then you can answer it? Yeah, okay. My question is, he's made it very clear on his public profile that this man is, does not believe in objective morality. Why and how can you say this in one breath and then starting passing moral judgments which are based on liberalism? Can you explain how atheism accounts for that or how it does As it? As I say, that's a two core fallacy. It's not a it two core fallacy. fallacy. It's, it, 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 is, it, is, it is last for you as well. It's simply saying, well, you do this too, so who are you to speak? That's not what no, we're doing no. here. We are working on your worldview. Your worldview claims that morality is objective and your worldview has objective moral statements like okay. the ones I've highlighted. It's your job to prove yeah. that those can be coherent with any God kind of objective so. morality. God is all-knowing. God said so. That's what we believe. Anything God says is all-knowing. Anything all -knowing. God says is moral. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Can well, you refute that, please? I don't need to. All well, I need, all no, I you need can't to do, do it. That's listen, why. I'm not trying to change your mind. I'm trying, <laughs> I'm trying to talk for the audience. And if the audience okay. find moral precepts within Islam that they disagree with, they have to disagree with If Islam. you have an all-knowing agency... as you have said, as yeah, you have ahead. said, if God says something is moral, then it is moral as a That's what we say, yeah. And so yeah. If, if the people here this evening disagree with the moral precepts of Islam, yeah, they have to disagree with Islam. Yeah. Socialization. Uh, well, yes, so okay. let's talk about uh, that and let's okay. see if it's really socialization. There's something more to it than that. Okay. You said, if I heard you correctly, anything that God says is moral. Absolutely. How do you know what God said? Well, okay, here, go back to our argument that I said, that we said that 
We have revelations of all time, the final revelations of the Quran. It has a falsifiability test. I gave you four things preservation, inimitability, contradictions, and I also taught you about predictions of the Quran and the Sunnah. Now, in order for you to say that the Quran is false, you have to falsify it. Like a scientist would have to falsify a theory for, in order for them to say that that is wrong. Now, if you can't produce any evidence for that, then really you, you can only remain agnostic on the issue. How, if do, I, if, how, do, you know, sorry. how do you know that the words contained in the Quran? were the words that were actually supposed to have been spoken to Muhammad by the angel Gabriel, supposing that any of us in the modern world can actually answer? believe anything From like Abdul. that. Yeah, Abdul. Okay, so, so first and foremost, with regards to morality, it's actually completely irrelevant in this debate concerning when we're discussing re explanation of reality. If you don't believe in objective morality, mm -hmm. then there's nothing to compare the morality of Islam with That's right. to say that That's it right. is uh, discordant with it. Yes. Right? So I think yes. it's, it's a massive red herring, and I think, I think that friend of yours will talk about a few fallacies concerning bringing it up in the first place. Mm -hmm. You have to first present to us objective what morality, is yeah. and then compare it to Islam's morality and yes. say, there's, they, 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 don't, they don't fit, but yes, you can't, and that's my point. Mm -hmm. um, and also the, the fact that you say, well, if we don't like some morality in the, back, in the past or some basis of, for justifying morality in the past, we can mm -hmm. change it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what's scary. Because in modern, was it 21st century Europe and on 20th century Europe, need, need, need I say more, um, people thought that morality of people's protections of rights and things were no longer convenient for the, nation, the, the nation's security. And then they prejudicially mm. uh, persecuted certain minorities because it was no longer beneficial from their estimation. Mm. And there's no objective basis to argue against it other than you say, well, I, I personally don't like or find it um, distasteful yeah. what they did. So that's, that is actually scary that you don't have objective morality because th there's no actual promise of of rights that you can actually uh, underwrite. There um, are. As for the, well, well no. Do you want to let um, I mean, well, yes. That, I mean, there are. Okay. I mean, it, you're either yeah. asking a question or you're just having okay, another opening sure. statement. Look, the subjectivity of morality doesn't lie at the level of the act itself. It lies at the level of the motivations. I can say to somebody, like we, I, I am a, a psychological hedonist in the same way that Mill was. I can say to, I, I know what people's motivations are, ultimately speaking, and, I, and there are objective facts to be known about how to achieve a goal. So it's not a case, moral subjectivism Mill, Mill didn't say this. Moral objectivism, no, mor problem. moral, I said I'm a psychological utilitarian, uh, okay. utilitarian like John Stuart Mill, not just a utilitarian. Okay, well, I'll respond and, to and you. I, ho I hope the audience can notice the difference in the level of interjection here. Like, I'm, I'm trying to really listen to what you have to say, but you've got to let me respond. Okay, go ahead. Psychological utilitarianism uh, means that we can know what people's motivations are, and I think we can. There are objective things to be known about how to achieve those goals. If somebody thinks that something's right and I think it's wrong, it's not a case of throw your hands up in the air and say it's everybody's opinion. That's not what moral subjectivism is. That's confusing moral subjectivism with moral relativism. That's not what we're doing. No, no, no hold on. No, and yeah. those are not the same thing. Can, can we respond? Good. All right, so uh, Mill, in chapter four of his book on utilitarianism, he mm. actually gave us an exact way of identifying what he called the principle of utility. Yes. And through that, he talked about desirability and how when you see that something yeah. is desirable for someone, then that is, a, that is an evidence that it's something which ought to be done. Okay. Now, he, hold yeah, on, excuse, excuse me. It's not true. No, hold on, you can check. I've just given you a reference. Yeah, you can the, check. The, the title can, is can not I, called You're preview. interjecting now. Yes, I am, because the, the, the so, title so is not... level the, of interjection? The, the, title, the title, I didn't say the audience can notice I'm not interjecting. I said the audience can notice the disparity in it. Sometimes okay, so the interjection, interjection is needed. And the interjection so here is that the title... The title of that chapter, there is a purpose. There is a reason why the title of that chapter is not the proof of utilitarianism. It is not. It's like the title of that chapter... Chapter is, the, book. the title of that chapter is uh, uh, the, the kinds of proofs to which utilitarianism is susceptible. No, no, hold on. The title of the chapter is proof of utilitarianism. It's not. You get the check, book. You can check it now. Okay, it is, well, well, it is well, the well, types well. of proof that utilitarianism Excuse is susceptible me. to. John Stuart Mill wrote the book himself. You can get the copy from Waterstones now. Everyone in the exactly. audience can Google it. it. Yes, it's actually the, the title is proof of utilitarianism. Chapter that's, four. That's what people call it. That's not what Mill wrote. Mill, oh, who, who calls it that? The title Mill. Mill call, the, the, no. Mill what are you saying? Mill doesn't call it the proof of utilitarianism. That's what it's titled. He avoids it. He does not. That's say the name that. of the chapter, my it's friend. It's not the name of the chapter. Okay, so should we get it up? Yeah, if you'd like to. Okay, if anyone's got utilitarianism, we can see. Okay, um, anybody has a copy of the book? Let's leave it on that as a reference point. Okay, yes, my friend. No, it's important. It's important. The reason why. It's important. The reason why. Either way, either way. Look, guys, come on, because it's, it's, it's sort of descending into chaos. Um, yeah. We want to get Abdullah and then we'll get Colin in afterwards. Okay, so just to, to continue what I said. Um, oh, is he right? It's not proof of that. Okay, well, I can see that point. If he's, if he's right, I can see the point. That's fine, because okay. I, don't, I don't care if you're right or wrong about that. It, it, yeah. the, the thing that matters is the point that he was making. And the point that he was making is that you can't prove utilitarianism, because he's a moral nihilist in that sense. But he said that there are certain proofs to which it's So if you can't prove it, why make a case? So because you can't prove that 
the point the mill made with so, the visible so, thing. So subjective. The, right, let okay, me answer the question. Tell, the the yeah, point yeah, the mill yeah, made yeah, with the mind. visible thing, which you brought up, is that the only evidence we have that something is visible is that it can be seen. That's what he said. Now we, we can't prove okay, that this, can't prove we can't prove it, why, why that this water okay. is visible. Okay. But we're both okay. 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 And if we can use the same one level thing. of proof yeah, to, 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 to understand moral okay. it's, Just, not, it's not a deductive so one proof, thing, it's an inductive. Why use an argument? One thing. For, for, for someone who said that uh, there are many things that you know you don't know in the universe and things that you can't presume. Yes. For you to claim that you now know uh, people's motivations uh, with the same kind of certainty enough to make it uh, uh, to derive some objective moral system yes. is somewhat of a contradiction there because everyone's yes. motivations might be unique or different yes. or, uh, or unknowable to you anyway. Certainly, mm. we never understand the viewpoint of a psychopath of someone right. who has the inability to empathise. Well, the and psychological all the, is quite good on that. Actually. The, yeah, but look, the study, of course, but to make a claim that basically that you can understand everyone's um, motivations or there is some kind of unique template of motivations motivations that all human beings uh, subscribe to or, or can, can fit into is really contradicting what you said earlier on, saying that you yes. don't actually know, or you don't make claims to know things which you don't directly observe. Oh, I, I, right? make, I make claims okay, about morality and I also that, didn't say that. Brief response to that from Alex and I, I do, on the last question and we're going to open up to audience questions. I do, I do make claims about morality, that, that's not a problem. Um, I, I never said that I didn't. Uh, I also didn't say that I don't make Where claims Where have you about, seen morality? Is it in a hypothetical I also didn't say that you have to see things to be able to prove them. Oh. Okay, so, so so are they illusionary for you? I, I, I would agree with that statement. I'm right. glad, I'm glad okay, you agree with that. Let's leave it there. We're in agreement. Brilliant. Colin, I'm, do you want I'm, to do the last yes, question? Yes, I'm still waiting for an answer to my question of how you can possibly be sure that what are supposed to be the words spoken by God, or rather by the angel Gabriel point to, that. to yeah. Muhammad, are actually the words spoken, if indeed they were spoken at all. Okay, brief okay. response to that, and then we're opening up to the audience. Okay, so... Um, a couple of days ago, I presented a lecture on how do you know Islam is true when there's so many different, uh, let's say, con conf conflicting or competing belief systems. Uh, in essence, f from every aspect, from the Islamic concept of God being a main issue, which is what my presentation was trying to focus on, the Islamic concept of God is um, almost completely unique to Islam with the possible exceptions of uh, variations of Judaism and uh, philosophers who've you know, reflected upon the possibilities of what could exist and what create all existence, and they've all come to the same conclusion, just like good old the Greek uh, Xenophon is, that there must be an ultimate creator who's infinite and he's unlike created things. Xenophon is a famous Greek philosopher who believed that if uh, uh, he rejected polytheism and rejected uh, idols that look like human beings, saying if a cow had a god, it would make the, the gods to look like cows. So he didn't, he wasn't an atheist, he just rejected polytheism. And so we would basically uh, kind of side with that view. But I the Islamic you a very specific question yeah. about yes. where, what the angel Gabriel is supposed to have said to, to Muhammad. How can you possibly know, how can anybody possibly know that that was actually what happened? How yeah, can you and, know? explain? And, and if I, if I, let me just finish my point, which is Islam is basically, if you, mm. I took, when I encountered it, I encountered it and I took it as a hypothesis mm -hmm. for how to explain reality, as one possible hypothesis. After looking at different belief systems, including um, or lack thereof, let's say atheistic positions in belief system, naturalism or, or, or materialism, uh, communism and such and such, I basically you know, found contradictions and things that didn't make sense. And it kind of almost had a process of elimination that Islam was the only one left that actually uh, didn't suffer any internal contradictions both compared to the observable reality as well as within itself. And that's a very tough thing to, it's a very tall order to actually achieve if you're not explaining well, everything, quite literally everything. So, um, and caveat, not the particularities of things like, you know, quarks and bosons in case you actually say, oh, I don't, you're, you're, you're claiming to explain everything. No, um, but what I, am, what I noticed is that Islam was the only one left. And then after further investigation, after I thought maybe it could have been a different way, maybe if uh, one particular Islamic doctrine didn't shouldn't exist or if it was a different way. And I realized that that produces contradictions to the point that I came to the conclusion that Islam was the only possible explanation to explain reality, which is why I was very uh, yeah. thrilled to do this debate in the first place. But yeah. Before, before, yeah, without, without going to things like the, you know, hell's existence mm -hmm. and all this other stuff, um, the main key selling point you, you say of Islam, of the hypothesis of Islam, mm -hmm. is to explain reality was its concept of God, which is uh, almost virtually uh, unique to itself, mm -hmm. and it, it's just rationally consistent and coherent. I didn't ask you about Islam's concept of God. I asked you very specifically about how you can possibly know that the concept of God, whatever it is, that emerges from the Quran can have been 
dictated to Muhammad by the angel Gabriel. I take it, therefore, that you cannot answer that question. Thank you. Well, um, it, it's kind of like the, the equivalent kind of challenge what you're saying. I mean, now, we can discuss how do we know the, mess, the messenger that related the message uh, is, uh, how do we know from, from analysis of that that it's accurate? But I wanted just to kind of That's what do, I'd like to know. That's I know. What I was I, asking. I know. And I, I wanted to do a kind of a different angle to answer that question, which is what got you, me into Islam in the first place you're wasn't answering answer, a different let, question. Let me finish, sir. What got me into Islam in the first place wasn't me uh, looking at the claims or trying to go back in the time machine to find out if the Prophet Muhammad existed or the angel Gabriel came to him. I looked at the message itself and the consistency of the message itself with the universe. I uh, came, uh, gave me, uh, led me to a conclusion that they both come from the same author, and that's why I became Muslim. In other words, you can't possibly know, it's just the author. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll, leave, it we'll leave it to the audience. Uh, we'll see what they have let's have say. some audience questions. Yeah. The gentleman in the middle there. The word uh, reality in the proposition is a very big word. I think it might be productive to focus a little bit away from cosmology for a while and then discuss biological reality. Colin raised one too. Um, I was interested that Mr. Hijab used a, a very interesting, rather provocative phrase. He said, God begets not, nor is begotten. Now, that obviously raises hoary chestnuts about biological evolution. I'm, I'm going to assume that nobody in this room denies that life forms have evolved over time in our bit of the known universe. The big question is, was there agency behind that? And speaking as a biologist, it's clear to me that one of the driving forces behind what I consider to be the evolutionary principle is faulty copying, uh, which occasionally opportunistically results in benefits to an organism and therefore proliferation of that gene. The, the big question is, assuming we all accept that life forms have evolved, was there agency behind that in your case? Is the agency delivering Okay, so there's two questions there. Do you agree with the theory of evolution? Okay. So, and what was the oh, agency behind it? Uh, it do, do I believe there's agency behind it? Okay. But, yeah. Okay, so, so in essence, um, as Muslims, we don't dispute what we observe from the universe. The Quran tells us to observe the universe and to understand the how, how God instituted things, the mechanisms God put in place to bring things about. So that's not a problem and we have no issue, we have no truck with uh, animal evolution and uh, evolution of obviously microbiotic life and things like this. There's no problem like this and change. But now for you to claim that the, the process of copying and mutation that occurs, which you, to claim and call it faulty copying, is actually making an assumption of, teleologic, uh, of, of telos, as the Greeks would say, of uh, intention that life has an intention to create perfect copies, all right? But if, you, if, if a person is a materialist, uh, let's say, that you, you say that all well, things happen out of necessity, right? Things just occur out, out of necessity. And what I'm positing, or what we would, let's say, view it as everything that happens, all the mechanisms uh, in life, as well as in inanimate objects throughout the universe, inanimate matter, let's just say, all these mechanisms have been instituted by God, so there's no problem or contradiction that we have with that at all whatsoever, whatever the case might be, whatever the science reveals. Okay, so you agree with evolution and the driving force is God? Um, can, I, can I answer the question? No, 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 well? we say that all, me question. all mechanisms were instituted by God, yes. Okay. Okay. Might, uh, uh, Let's have one question, one answer, because otherwise that's we're going to go around circles. Yep. Um, yes, gentlemen at the top right. Like Could you speak up a bit? Uh, which was that atheists aren't special and that Muslims have been debating Christians and Jews or Zoroastrians for years. I come from a Muslim and Zoroastrian family. I'm sure there are Catholics here or Hindus or Jews. The thing is, with Islam and atheism, is Islam makes some claims and atheism says we're not making claims. With Islam and Christianity or Islam and Judaism, Islam is making a claim. Christianity is making a different claim. Judaism is making a different claim. They all evolved at different times. 
uh, Islam and Christianity and Judaism all make similar claims, but there are significant differences which are of a nature that is very, very important for Muslims in that for Islam to be true, it has to be able to show that, say, Christian claims about, say, Jesus being the son of God aren't true. So rather than attempting to argue against atheism, how do you propose to suggest that Islam is right, that the Quran is right, and not the Bible or not the, the tongue? Yeah, so, so yeah. what the gentleman is essentially saying is on this side of the house, there are two leaps of faith. Yeah. First, God. The second, the Islamic God. Okay, so we've already shown from first principles how it can be conceived or can be reasoned that a necessary existence, which all other existence depend upon, uh, exists and is in fact necessary for existence. But in terms of the specific claim of Islam, I'll repeat the challenge, and obviously there are people in the audience here. I've said to you before, and I'll say it again, that Islam makes specific claims and challenges which are not found in other texts. And this makes Islam and its texts open to falsifiability. For example, number one is the preservation cha challenge. Chapter 15, verse 9, it says, in the nahnu in the We have certainly sent down the book and we will certainly preserve it. Chapter 4, verse 92, the contradiction challenge. For, you know, they would have found in it many contradictions. A third, uh, the third thing is the inimitability challenge. And we said before that this has quantifiable measures. And I'll give you one example. The Quran was a circumstantial rev revelation and it was revealed piecemeal, right? So for bit by bit. But despite the fact that the Quran was a circumstantial revelation and it was re revealed piecemeal, you'll find that there is an incredible knitted togetherness, um, a consistency, a coherence of the Quranic text, which make it almost impossible, I would argue, that it would, been, uh, would have been from human authorship. For example, the Quran in chapter 3, verse 59 says, Inna mathala that certainly Jesus is like Adam. God created him from dust and said, Be and he was. Now, notice it says he's like Adam. And if you count the amount of times Adam is mentioned in the Quran, it's 25 times. If you count the amount of times that Jesus mentioned in the Quran, it's also 25 times. Now, this is one of, I would say, a plethora of examples, which if you were to turn this into a probability machine, you'll find makes it highly doubtable, unprobable that this could have been uh, done from someone who is being asked questions and, and answering in the form of revelation. The fourth thing I mentioned was the, predict the predictions of the Qur'an. So for example, the fact that the Qur'an in chapter 30 verses 1 to 6 predicts that Rome would beat, uh, the Roman Empire would beat the Persian Empire from 6 to 9 years, and we have corroborating evidence from this from non-Islamic sources. For example, Theophius in the 9th century writes this down and so on. Now the thing is, if you find all other, this is my claim, my claim is if you look at all other religions, world religions, if there are predictions that are made, I will be able to find you, and this is a challenge I'll put out there for everyone, I'll be able to find you a false prophecy from the major world religions. If someone claims to be a fortune teller, Nostradamus, Charles Russell, from the, you know, whoever it may be, those individuals made a series of predictions, some of which came true, some of which did not. Now what I'm saying is quite bold. I'm saying that the Islamic position is you will not be able to find one thing that the Prophet of Islam or the Quran says will come true that does not come true. And from that we, we predicate our cosmological understanding that okay the hereafter which is something we can't see just like the future is unseeable is also going to be actualized, materialized in the same way that everything else has. So we have falsifiability test. This falsifiability test is not in other scriptures and in order for you to disregard or discard the Quran and the Sunnah you first have to go through the, the process just as a scientist would of falsifying our claims. Okay, that's an interesting Thank you. point. Does anyone on this side want to respond to that? Because it's a good, a good point. I there's internal consistency in the Quran and it's been dictated piecemeal over time. How is it not that there's been a higher order dictating things? I mean, I'd, I'd rather brisk move on to other questions, but I don't think that... I'd say internal consistency is certainly required to, to say that the Qur'an is accurate, but it's not uh, sufficient. Yeah, I said four things. That was one. Yeah. Okay. I would agree with that, actually. Mm. Yeah. Okay, let's get another question. Does anyone want to ask anything? I, I, don't, I, I don't think you actually responded properly to that question, which is how can you, how can you demonstrate that what is written in the Bible, for example, is not true when if what's written in the Quran contradicts it. I gave as an example in, uh, in my uh, address the Islamic view that it was not Jesus who died on the cross. How can you possibly prove that? How can you know it? 
even if it, even if it were even if it were so how can you possibly prove it how can you claim that anything like that can be known with certainty and how can you show that the, the people who reported it in the in the bible were wrong can i say for the record i don't i don't think that's necessary to do um, because okay. i have to be very careful with the burden of proof here which is that mm. the, the 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 proof needs to lie with the person making the claim, right? The Christians claim that Jesus died and, and, was, and was risen. They need to prove that. The fact that I can't disprove it doesn't mean that um, I can't have a case against it. I would, I would Come to the dark oh, side. No, I, I, mean, I, don't, I don't think that the Christian claim is necessarily any more credible than the Islamic one. I don't think they could, they don't think Christians can prove it either, it's what they believe. But I don't think you can, you can disprove it or, or give a credible opinion one way or the other. Do you have well, a do you think lack of evidence? I mean, Sorry, well, what, what I would say is uh, certainly in, in science there's many hypotheses. And hypotheses, I suppose, is a prediction or a claim based on a previous theory. And people like to check out the claims to see if they are consistent with what they can observe. So I, don't, I never had a problem with actually checking out someone's claims and seeing if there was a, any proof and also if it was, if it was internally consistent. And my claim against Trinitarian Christians, uh, with all due respect to any Trinitarian Christians here, because they're not represented on this panel, of course, is that I believe that it has internal contradiction between an infinite, immortal God mm. and a finite, mortal man who is also God at the same time, as well as belief in one and three, God is one and three at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, the, con the crucifixion is really inconsequential to, to that matter, because mm -hmm. it's just a, a historical happenstance or a claim of a happenstance. But I suppose, really, and just to kind of answer that, that person's point uh, in another angle, and very, very briefly, if, you, if I may be permitted, is upon uh, the, the question of discussion of is there a burden of proof? Is there a burden of proof on us? Is there a burden of proof on them? And they're not saying they're not making any claims, so yes. isn't the burden of proof meant to be only on us? I would say that everyone here has a burden of explanation, mm. an explanation of reality, at least ultimately. Right? Mm -hmm. And the whole point about science is to try to seek to uh, chip away at uh, reality to uncover a local explanation for things, but we're talking about an ultimate explanation of things, and I'm going to make a very strong claim, which is that only that the idea of an infinite thing which has will, that can initiate by choice, is the only possible ultimate explanation for all things that avoids contradiction. Any other possibility possesses contradiction, right? yes. including an explanation of reality that does not require God. Any, any other possibility does not make sense other than an infinite power uh, and world creator. And that's my, my claim and the only thing, and my proof of that is it's the only one that avoids contradiction and yet explains reality. Okay, let's leave it with that. Um, one to two minute closing statements, um, starting with um, Colin. Oh, sorry. Wasn't really expecting that. Okay, Sorry, well, we can start with uh, Alex yeah. and then. No, no, I'm, I'm happy, happy to do it. It'll be very brief. Um, there's an old Russian proverb that says, "It is good to know the truth, but it is better to be happy." And when you're talking about reality, reality can be very unpleasant. Um, religion is very bad for. Uh, for talking about reality, but it's quite good for talking about happiness. Um, so if happiness is more important to you than truth, then Islam, like any other religion, can protect you against it, against reality. Um, otherwise, I suggest you stick with reality. It may be unpleasant, but it is actually what should guide you. Okay, closing statement, um, Abdullah. Okay. Well, firstly, I'd like to thank my interlocutors on both sides. Thank you very much for attending, and I, uh, I, I look forward to maybe future discussions with, with all of you. So I'll just kind of finish up by saying that I don't think my arguments have been, my four kind of problems that I've posed uh, to atheists that have been uh, kind of addressed, the explanation for change, matter, finitude, and specificity, these things haven't been explained. If this moment depended on an infinite amount of pre-existing moments with no beginning, no start point, then we wouldn't get to this point. And of course, if there is a start point, then the question is what's making this starting thing uh, begin the chain of, of creation or causality or whatever, uh, or contingency, whatever you want to call it. Well, if it's something else, then it's not the first thing. So if it's initiating, then it can only do so out of, out of choice. And that's the only explanation that avoids any contradictions. And I think I'll kind of finish up by saying that um, I'm glad that science wasn't invoked necessarily on either side uh, to prove either side's point. Well, I will say this, just a slight kind of interesting observation. In the Quran, 
commands Muslims to observe the world, to see how God made and instituted things, and Islamic science, well, science within Islamic civilization flourished because of it, with Islamic scientists citing the Quran as their motivation to understand God's will more, the second holy book of Islam, the universe, the ayat of Allah. But there's no command in atheism to do so. In fact, you could be a solipsist, a nihilist, or an existentialist, and not believe there's even an external reality in the first place. So I think with atheism, it's not a question of, uh, of uh, you know, atheism is attached to science, but rather that atheism can't even justify an external reality to even investigate in the first place, whereas Islam is assured of one. Okay. You, can also, you can also be an atheist and a horse rider. They have nothing to do with each other. Atheism doesn't entail certain beliefs. and the, like, that, that you, don't, you can be a solipsistic atheist, but you don't have to be a solipsistic atheist. Um, you're right to say that the issues that, we, that, that you bring up, especially the four points you make, haven't been addressed. Uh, perhaps they could have been if we could have gone to the end of a sentence. Uh, but I think that, likewise, the challenges that I proposed in my opening statements weren't fully addressed. The, the problems of, of morality. And I, I'd, hate to, I'd hate to... Um, uh, compel or expect you to do so now in a closing statement, that would be unfair. Uh, but I hope that it hasn't escaped people that that hasn't been discussed. And I think one of the reasons for that is because it can't be justifiably uh, uh, addressed. Um, although certainly Mr. Jab has, has tried to on his YouTube channel, so you should uh, go and listen to what he has to say. I just have to say that um, appeals to, to the fact that, um, for instance, you say, you know, that, well, America had, had uh, laws that said you could get married at 10. It's like, yeah, America was wrong, and so was your prophet. Like, the difference is that whilst we can progress morally as a society, uh, if, we, if we base it upon constitutions and say that the, the moral issues that are infused within them don't depend on the person who's saying it or the fact that it comes from God, uh, that's a hell of a lot easier than when you come up against the, moral, uh, the, the, the possibility for moral progress. Mm -hmm. Uh, with statements that come from the unalterable word of the divine creator of the universe. Um, and that's where I'd probably leave it. Um, yeah. uh, Sana, please. You know, one minute, Don't go over here. No, it's not one minute, because he had two. Um, I want to no, say... Yeah, one minute. I was you. Okay, let me add two. You said one or two. Here's what I want to say, ladies and gentlemen. You see, this is the reality of atheism, where you have a claim, first of all, from a nihilist, someone who does epistemological nihilist, an existential nihilist, uh, a moral nihilist, someone who does not believe in value judgments, saying you're right and you're wrong. That's unfair and it's unsubstantiated. That is an active claim that he's not been able to show from first principles. You see, the thing is, with atheists, they like to make claims that they cannot substantiate. He said himself, you can be an atheistic solipsist, which means you can, by the way, what that means is you can believe you're living in a matrix world. So if you can't even prove the external reality, or even an absolute reality, or even that rational faculties are truth reliable, then why are you making a claim that atheism, or trying to suggest that atheism potentially is better than Islam in, in, in understanding reality? If you don't make that claim, then you're conceding that Islam offers something, whereas atheism, by virtue of the fact, offers nothing. And to be honest with you, I have to say, I have to say, I am actually convinced, you know, I, I have some doubts after this debate. There's some skepticism. I doubt the existence of atheism or atheists. Because if atheists, no seriously, because if atheist means someone who's lacking or disbelieving in God, what is a God? A God is an object of worship. What is worship? Worship is ultimate obedience to an entity. And I don't believe that any human being is not ultimately obedient, loving, submissive to anything. In fact, like Abdullah said, they're polytheists. That's what the Quran says, chapter 39, verse 29. Allah says in the Quran, He says, <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Bal aksarum la yalamun. Inna kamayitun wa inna hum ayitun. ثم إنكم يوم القيامة عيد ربكم تختصمون فمن أظلم ممن كذب على الله وكذب بآياته 
وكذب بالصدق إذ جاءه فمن أظلم ممن كذب على الله وكذب بالصدق إذ جاءه أليس في جهنم مثوى للكافرين So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran He says ضرب الله مثلا Allah has struck a parable رجلا فيه شركاء A man who has many different slave masters ورجلا سلما لرجل And another person, another man with only one slave master Are they the same in comparison with each other? Alhamdulillah, praise be to Allah. بَلْ أَكْثَرُهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Nay, most of them do not know. You're going to die, i.e. Prophet Muhammad, and they are going to die. Then you will be presented to Allah, disputing with one another, i.e. on the Day of Judgment. Allah then says, And who is more oppressive than the one who denies God's signs and persistently denies his evidences when they are presented to him. Is there not in the hellfire a resting place for the oppressors? Atheists have many gods. Muslims are just telling atheists to redirect their veneration, admiration and their worship instead of to the many gods, to the one God. And that, that is our case, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, it's been a long night, but a very enjoyable one. Um, thank you very much. Apologies for the any passion or at all. I'd expect it if you believe that you're, you're right about these things. Thank you for your contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'm still waiting for an answer to my question. Are you just to become an atheist? No, it's, it's all right. It's it's no, 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 because... Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, that's a great idea. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Just get there. I just hope this will... Can you order a pint? Yeah, I know. Can you get a pint in the middle?